Welcome, kids. It is time once again for Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. That's me. I am your host. We're here on October 16th, middle of October, middle <laughs> of the wormhole. <laughs> and yet, it's it's really a quiet week astrologically. Like, like this it could be a short episode, I think, in some ways, because there's just not a whole lot to talk about in terms of events, the kind of events that I cover during this podcast. So, uh, well, when we get there, I'll, I'll, I'll be, you know, I'll say more, more about this, but it's, so it's like, it ain't a quiet week because we're in the middle of a tumultuous wormhole. It's just that in terms of the, the, the seven days from October 16th through the 22nd that we're going to be describing, this particular seven-day period doesn't have major bumps in the road or turns in the way or grappling energies that we've got to work with. But we are in an eclipse. <laughs> Wormhole. Make no mistake <laughs> about it. It still is October. That's right. It's still October. It's still a juicy it's... month. But let's start as we do with a question. This actually is from Christina. She wrote this to me way back in the summer. Um, and, um, I'm just sort of keeping it on the side till there was a good moment to bring this up. So thank you, Christina, for this question. She writes, Thank you for your weekly message. I so enjoy listening to it every Monday. <laughs> Yay. I have a question. As I looked into my chart for this passing new moon, so this would have been for her new moon in the summer, passing new moon, I see that I have both a square between transiting Neptune to natal Venus and a square between transiting Venus to natal Neptune. And she goes on and asks, is this a double square in some way or have a double meaning or a double impact or how to think with this kind of configurations? Are they common or rare? What more interesting is there with this kind of double configurations. That's a funny sentence. She said, is there, is there anything interesting to talk about in this sort of a double? So let me just repeat to make sure that anybody uh, who's listening can follow this, <laughs> right? So the word transiting, if we use the word transiting in a sentence, then we're talking about the planet that's in outer space moving. So if I say transiting Venus, we're talking about Venus moving. And if we say transiting Neptune, we're talking about Neptune moving up there mm. in the sky. So then the other moniker is natal. So natal Neptune would be where Neptune was when Christina was born, Neptune in her chart. I would might use the, the, the word her Neptune or your Neptune. Same thing with natal Venus would be where Venus was when Christina was born. I might use the term your Venus or natal Venus. So Transiting Neptune in a square to natal Venus means that Neptune, who's now in Pisces, is making a 90-degree angle to where Venus was when Christina was born. That's a long transit, lasts about a year, could be even two based on the geometry. It's a very slow conflict energy because squares always mean conflicts and obstacles connecting to faith and flow and spiritual sensibility and being in intuition, teaching her in a long, you know, sort of transit how to let that intuitive information into her heart when the 90-degree angle will have it show up as emotional confusion. So that's a long transit because transiting Neptune is squaring her Venus. 
Meanwhile, during this new moon in the summer, clearly Venus was coming along and wherever she was, transiting Venus was making a 90 degree angle to her natal Neptune. So that means that up in the sky, both Venus and Neptune by transit are touching her chart. And where they're touching her chart is where Neptune and Venus were when she was born. So there is not like a name for this phenomena. When a transiting planet touches a natal point, when that same planet, God, now I've lost my way, right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> but you're getting it, right? You're the ears of the audience. You're getting what I'm saying? Yes. Right. So I just want to make sure you get it, Zoe, because if you're getting it, then they're getting it, right? There is not a name for this phenomenon, but it does set up. No, so Christine is like, is it, does it mean this? Is it a double meaning, a double impact? I would call it, yeah, a kind of double thematic moment. Hmm. Okay. Where the theme of the larger transit transiting Neptune squaring her Venus is like a year-long thing that involves both emotions and love and, and intimacy because Venus is involved, but also spiritual connection and flow and things that are hidden, but in conflict, Neptune and Pisces in a square. So then when Venus comes along and swipes by a much faster transit, because transiting Venus moves very quickly, and so that influence will only be brief, because it also involves the same planets, Neptune and Venus, the themes are the same. So it's like transiting Neptune squaring Venus is like a year-long opportunity to lift the delusions of how your emotional body is speaking to you. Like you're confused about things you're perceiving with your emotional body and you're actually going to learn how to read it better by virtue of going through this transit. And then Venus squaring her Neptune says, ah, there's an emotional moment that might be very, very, very confusing to you while you're in this longer process of trying to lift the confusions in the heart. So this can happen with lots of different planets where the themes are the same because the planets are the same, only one is transiting the other in this way that I'm trying to convey. Okay. So, you know, when, when listen, Christina, uh, I hope you're happy that I'm answering this question because you'll remember I wrote you back saying, I'm not sure that this is a question for the podcast because it felt like it was more personal. So this can happen, right? Where the, the, the same two planets, two in the chart, two by transit, are, are touching each other in this inverted sort of way. So it's, I wouldn't call it rare. I would call it infrequent. And when it happens, I would say that the, the way to sit with it is just to think, ah, the theme of the longer transit, being driven by the slower moving planet, is getting an extra double emphasis of theme when the slower moving planet is triggering the same other natal planet in question. So, not rare, but infrequent. Look at the themes of the two planets involved, if this should ever come up, and just think double that. Now, we are in the wormhole. <laughs> Make no mistake about it. So while there isn't a big bump in the road this week, there's something very interesting happening on the 18th and the 19th. That's Wednesday and Thursday that will potentially offer some big awarenesses of stuff from the past that needs to be let go of in this whole eclipse lunar cycle. So this is a south node eclipse, meaning the sun is near the south node. So the new moon over the weekend was sun, moon, and south node all in Libra. So when an eclipse is driven by the sun in alignment with the south node, then the whole cycle is designed somehow to get us away from the past. It's a transformative release 
eclipse season when it's sun in alignment with the south node. Six months from now, the next eclipse season that we have in six months will have the sun in alignment with the north node. And the language in that eclipse season will be much more about what's starting up, what faded transformational direction do you want to move in anew? Whereas in this eclipse season, it's more like, what do you got to let go of in order to move more powerfully forward? And of course, I've said a lot about this. I'm probably repeating myself ad infinitum, but it's all about love. It's all about how we live in our hearts. You had a Venus retrograde in Leo that set us up with months of process to deliver us really to this eclipse season. The Venus finished her retrograde just before we entered the eclipse wormhole in a new moon ruled by Venus. Libra new moon is ruled by Venus. The full moon in two weeks is in, in Taurus, also ruled by Venus. So if we're letting stuff go because it's a south node eclipse and Venus has her thumbprint all over this period of time, anything that we're like letting go of or releasing in this eclipse season has got to have something to do with how we live in our hearts, how we're processing our emotions, how we approach intimacy and connecting deeply to others and things about that that need to be let go of in order for us to have a richer, more loving experience. So one of the things that will happen in every eclipse wormhole is that the sun will align with whatever node of the moon that is generating the eclipse exactly. So for example, when we moved into this eclipse, when the eclipse happened on Saturday of this past weekend, the sun was at 21 degrees of Libra and the south node was at 24 degrees of Libra. So three degrees apart, more like almost four, three and three quarters of a degree. Close enough in geometrical proximity to generate the eclipse. It is in fact the closeness of the sun with one of these nodes that causes the system to move through the shadow. So the day that the sun aligns with whichever node of the moon it's near has a role in the wormhole of a kind of awareness opportunity. The sun is our conscious awareness. So when the sun is directly on top of the south node by exact conjunction, and it's the south node, meaning the past, and it's a release eclipse, it's like taking a, a Klieg light flashlight, like a bright, bright flashlight, and shining it into the septic tank where all the shit is being held to be released. Gross. <laughs> I love my, my bathroom metaphors. I know. <laughs> and one of my favorite things ever to say is like, dreams about poop. <laughs> <laughs> That's the eight-year-old in me. When I was eight years old, I went through a period of time where I just thought it was funny to scream out the word toilet bowl. So random. <laughs> anyway, so the septic tank is all the stuff that we hold until we're ready to release it. And it's a good, as silly as I'm being, it's a good image to understand the South Node because we really mm. do have to have a receptacle for the difficult things, the patterns, the habits, and the events that trouble us that have to be let go of. We got to have someplace to hold it until the readiness arrives for letting go. So you can think of the South Node as being, you know, holding on to everything, not only from our past distantly, but also the recent past of bumpy events that, that cause us consternation. Those difficult thoughts and feelings get stored in the South Node. So here we are in a South Node eclipse designed to help us let that shit go the day that the Sun and the South Node are conjunct, which is Wednesday, is an opportunity to be able to see and be aware of some material from the past that we might not be able to see on another day. And I'll remind you that all solar transits have about a three-day influence, not, not just one, right? 
Okay, so let's put that over on the shelf for a minute. Understand that on Wednesday, big moment of the sun coming together with the south node, shining light of conscious awareness into our receptacle for letting go of the past. Now let's do a little teaching on something called the superior conjunction between Mercury and the sun. That happens on Thursday. The sun and Mercury are never far away from each other from our perspective. He's too close to the sun and the orbit is too rapid uh, that from our perspective, he can't really be much more than like 17 or 18 degrees on either side of the sun ever from our perspective. And then I always like to say this when talking about these two and talking about their close proximity. The sun represents our conscious awareness and Mercury represents our thinking and perception. And those two are not the same thing, though they're cousins. Our conscious awareness is much more aligned with the I am of us. The unchanging, unflappable sense of I know who I am. I have a beingness that I know to be me. And your sun placement in your natal chart describes that a little bit. Archetypally, by virtue of what sign it's in. Tendentially, by virtue of, you know, what house it's in in your chart and other aspects that might be made uh, at the moment of your birth. But the sun both in your chart for you individually and up there as I talk about it in general as an astrologer talking about the daily transits, the sun is our awareness of the I am of us. Mercury is the nonstop thinking, chattering, mindless sometimes voice up there that thinks it's all that in a bag of chips. It's the narrator that thinks that just because he's telling the story that he is the story. Mm -hmm. Right? The sun is the story. Mercury's just telling the story. Well, what if Mercury's telling you some bullshit? (laughs) (laughs) The mind does that all the time. There's all sorts of cute little isms like, don't believe everything you think. Yeah. I love that one because people do and they shouldn't. So this discreteness between conscious awareness and thinking that I think is an integral part of understanding how the self works to have maximum efficiency is to know that there's a difference because one cannot be changed and one can be changed completely. You cannot change your I am-ness, but you can certainly change how you're perceiving it, how you're thinking about it, and how you're speaking about it. Yeah. So there's something that happens with great regularity, which is the sun and Mercury coming together by conjunction. That's a moment when it happens where our conscious awareness, the I am of the sun and the thinking mechanism that narrates Mercury are in alignment. That's a day you can trust what you're thinking. Like that would be the day it's like, believe what you think. (laughs) Every other day, maybe not. But when the sun and Mercury are coming together by conjunction, you can believe what you're thinking or more accurately. I mean, I'm saying that because I thought it would be funny. Um, what I really mean is that there might be some important guidance delivered to us when the sun and Mercury come together in this conjunction. Now, when Mercury is retrograde, it's called the inferior conjunction. And it, if we looked at it through a telescope, we would see that Mercury is passing between us and the sun. The Mercury retrograde optical illusion would have it be that we're seeing Mercury inside of the orbit of the Earth around the sun. So when Mercury's retrograde and we can't see where the fuck we're going, this day is hugely important. It happens right at the midpoint, exactly halfway between the retrograde turnaround and the direct turnaround 21 days later. It's the aha moment that tells us what the retrograde theme is going to be. And I make a big deal about it every time Mercury's retrograde. Well, it happens when Mercury is in his free and clear period as well. Now it's called 
the superior conjunction because Mercury's on the other side of the sun from us. So it's not as deeply insightful a moment of awareness that you really want to be slowing down and paying attention to, not by a long shot. But it's still the I am awareness of the sun and the thinking perception of Mercury coming together. So there's wisdom and messages and guidance that can be made available with a peak this coming Thursday. Okay. Well, now we got to put them together. They're happening at the same time. Mercury and the sun are coming together by conjunction on top of the south node in the middle of a crazy eclipse wormhole. So yes, one peaks on Wednesday, one peaks on Thursday, and that makes no difference. You know, the, the moving planets don't know from the days of the week. <laughs> right, right. They're, you know, it's, it's happening like, but ump. <laughs> it's one thing. But ump, meaning buh and dump is one <laughs> conjunction and the other. But ump, Wednesday, Thursday. Awareness, messages. Mercury's a trickster, so look for sideways ways that we sometimes get guidance, like, Happy accidents, synchronicities, messages that come from indirect ways. So while it's not a crazy week in terms of bumps in the road, it's certainly a tumultuous passage we are in. Everything is amplified and intensified and energetically. And Wednesday and Thursday are really important days to be moving slowly enough and mindfully enough and maybe sitting down at some point during one of those two days for a good meditative dive into what you might be suddenly aware of <laughs> around, you know, material about your past that is being released at this time. It's a worthy investigation. I don't think anybody will be disappointed if, you, if you're asking the question, what do I need to know about what's being released from my unconscious mind at this time. And if there's anything I can do to help and assist, let me know, make it clear. Thank you, amen. Now, the weekend could be a little bit interesting. It happens to be the first quarter moon on Saturday. In the lunar cycle, there are four major pillars. The new moon is obviously the beginning, where we set intentions and have a sense of starting up new things. Two weeks later, we have the full moon, where we are both harvesting the benefit and releasing that which no longer serves. I call that gratitude and release. If we use the farming analogy, it's like we get the wheat berry and we leave the chaff, which we don't need, and by leaving it, it decomposes and fertilizes the field for the next crop. But there are two pillars halfway between each of these lunations that are just as key to the lunar cycle. Technically, there are like eight cycles in the moon cycle, but the ones that really count are these four. And that's the first quarter moon that happens halfway between the new and the full moon. And then the third quarter moon that's on the other side of the, of the full moon, halfway between that and the next lunar cycle. So this is a moment of crisis. If we use the farming analogy, which I love, we plant seeds in the new moon and seven days later that, and this is literal, about seven days after you stick a seed in the ground, it's gonna crack. That's right, it's gonna pop open and either fail or thrive. Mm. So in fact, at that crisis moment, if you were the seed itself, all you would know is, ah, I'm being split open. I'm out of balance. Not like, it's not right. It's not a moment when you know whether it's going to fail or thrive. You're just in the crisis that it might go either way. Mm. Just to round this out for all y'all, uh, 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 the third quarter moon is the same crisis because it's still the sun of our conscious awareness being in 90 degree odds with the moon. So we're out of balance between our conscious awareness and our unconscious self. The difference is in the beginning of the lunar cycle, it's just a crisis and a breakdown. We don't know where it's going to go. 
In the third quarter moon, we are past the full moon. We've gotten the harvest. We've gotten the benefit. We've let go of the, of the, of the shit we don't need. So we have some wisdom. So the third quarter moon, we are charged to disseminate the wisdom we have learned. In fact, the, the, the more subtle lunar cycle that happens at the third quarter moon is also called the disseminating moon. Not the quarter moon, but the very next little half cycle is where we disseminate what we've learned out into the world. But not this first quarter moon. That's just where we bump up against the wall of, I've planted a seed. It's cracking open. I don't know yet whether it will fail or thrive. Now, just a little added note here. This sounds like we're talking about the literality of the 28 and a quarter days of the lunar cycle, that what you intend is either going to happen or not a week later and uh, two weeks after that. It's like uh, th these are patterns that we move through with every lunar cycle, but this is an eclipse. So that means the first quarter moon is going to be felt more powerfully as a crisis moment where our I am consciousness of the sun and the unconscious expression of the moon are not in balance. They're at odds. Just like the floor and the wall are screaming at each other to do what the other's doing. The wall says lie down. The floor says stand up. Or the opposite. The wall says stand up. The floor says lie down. That one. That one. <laughs> and uh, nobody wins. In fact, we don't want anybody to win. If, if one of them wins, the, fall, the, the room falls down. The Scorpio mansion starts on Monday. In fact, it's the first thing we're going to talk about in the next week's podcast is that we are going to be fully in Scorpio season. And that doesn't actually happen until Monday, but that means that Sunday, the moon, the sun will be at the final degree of Libra. And that's a mastery moment, right? That, that, that we are to, to look back and understand, have we learned everything that the Libra mansion ruled by Venus and all about love. Have we learned everything? So I think it's just really interesting that Wednesday and Thursday bring us awareness of what we are leaving behind. Saturday's a literal crisis of eclipsian proportions because we will be out of balance between our conscious awareness and our unconscious impulses. And the very next day, with the sun at the 30th degree of Libra, that anoretic mastery degree, there's something elegant about what we might be able to be aware of as the week progresses that we might bump into as a deep crisis on Saturday, that Sunday then gives us the opportunity to kind of complete the awareness as the sun is in the final degree of Libra. And then on Monday, we dive into the deep, dark pool of Scorpio energy while still in this eclipse wormhole. You can count on next week being crazy. I was just thinking, bring on the feelings. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You got it. You have a Scorpio moon, though, so you know about that. Yeah. Deeply intense emotional mansion. And we've got a lot of air energy this week, right? Sun's in Libra. Mercury's in Libra. North node is in Aries. South node in Libra. It's all air. So there's a lot of intellect open during the week, but some... Deep things we got to look at, process, and be willing to let go of just in time to fall into the deep emotional intensity that will begin next week in a, in, a, in, a, in a richer and deeper way than it is even now. God, I, that <laughs> makes me think like, okay, now the darker, colder months have started. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, okay, equinox, that's cute. You know, it's fall. But like, okay, Scorpio season, diving into your yeah, feelings. Yeah, we're diving into I'm your like, feelings. Okay. And a willingness to understand that everything has to die in order for life to continue. And yeah. that level of acceptance is what Scorpio understands and will teach and bring to us. And we will be talking all about deep feelings and that process in next week's pod. Meanwhile, kids, have at it. Did you know that Michael has a daily astro alert? If you enjoy hearing the weekly astrology, you might like knowing more about each day. 
When you subscribe for the daily astro alerts, you'll get an in-depth explanation of the day's astrology sent right to your email. Subscriptions are only $10 a month, or you can purchase the yearly subscription at the reduced price of $100. To subscribe, head over to michaelenix.com. All right, it's dream segment time. Every week, Dr. Michael will interpret dreams that are sent in via email or take a live caller. If you would like your dream interpreted on the podcast, you can go ahead and email us at dreams at michaelenix.com. Hopefully your dream will make it onto the show. Okay, Michael, we have a question about nightmares, and um, I think we might have touched on this before, but it's been a while. So Mercy emailed in, hello, Dr. Michael. This is more of an inquiry of nightmares or bad dreams and their Mm. significance. Throughout my life, I've had a series of nightmares or bad dreams, but more significantly now, interestingly enough, I've been sober for about a year. And I have gone through an intense spiritual awakening the last two years. I'd like to think dreams are messages, but Hmm. what kind of message can a nightmare, think gruesome and gory, provide? I can't wait to hear your thoughts. Well, golly, uh, I love this question and congratulations on Clean and Sober. And if you're going to make a change with your conscious awareness, like becoming sober, the unconscious is going to go a little crazy. Mm. because you're not diminishing it with substance. I mean, that's the whole point, right? We're squirrely, we're uncomfortable in our skin. I'm an addict, so I know all about this. You know, it's like, ah, I don't want to feel this. <laughs> let's, let's do a little <laughs> drugs and let's, you know, change, change uh, how I am feeling. And so when you stop doing that, the unconscious will explode with stuff that you're no longer dampening down. And I do believe that there's a powerful connection between the process of getting clean and sober and what happens in the dream state. Well, she doesn't ask this question. I've had a lot of experience, both personally and with people, that when people get clean and sober, they very often have dreams of using, and that's usually felt as a nightmare, And I think it's important and valuable. I think it's compensatory. It helps the person who's struggling to stay clean and sober in their waking life visit with a part of them that wishes to be in the addiction again. But by visiting it in the dream state, they wake up able to be, you know, uh, committed to the clean and sober journey. And I had an experience 20 something years ago when I was in a second round of addiction that I had to do some more research in my 30s. Where as I was struggling to keep clean and sober, I had nightmares of um, being clean. Not nightmares, but dreams of being clean. And the minute I committed to sobriety again, I had dreams of using. So right there, I have direct experience, uh, both personally and working with others, that the dream world of someone working with being clean and sober is going to be rich and important. Now, there's certainly a belief in Jungian perspective, depth psychology, and I think even pop culture. And I say this too about nightmares, though I don't think we know this to be a scientific fact. And I think nightmares are memorable. And I think there's purpose behind that. That the unconscious has a desire to have certain things be known consciously, It generates the nightmare so that we will pay attention and remember it when we wake up. So in this particular query, it does sound like she's asking, is there some correlation between the gruesome nightmares I'm having and this choice to become clean and sober a year ago? And my answer is yes. Not only that, 
back to the idea that we we addicts tend to make choices around substances to feel less pain. And you know what? It works for a little while. <laughs> that's the problem with it. It works for a, a bit. But that's what's happening in the sort of addictive behavior model. I have a feeling yeah. I don't want. I move towards the substances that changes how I feel. Yay. Consequences galore, but that's why we do it. Take that away. And now the id or the unconscious turmoil or whatever word you want to use for the, for the dark, scary, frightened material that's down below has no buffer because you've taken away an habitual buffer. The fact that she's dreaming so gruesomely is probably why she's still clean. I mean, being, again, abstract and loosey-goosey with, with is, that, is that true? Is that verifiable? No, it's not. It's, it just sort of sounds good to say. But I believe it that the dream state is designed to help us visit uncomfortable and in some ways untenable feelings that we wish we did not have to. And so by removing one layer of protection, then the demons get louder. And thank God, that process of dreaming and visiting our shadowy spaces is what the healer is over time. We visit those scary places where we are in fear and destruction and uh, and then we wake up to do a better job on a Tuesday because Monday night we had a nightmare. This week, we have an email and dream from Holly. She says, Hi, Michael and Zoe. I've been listening to your podcast for a while now with my mom, and we are both big fans. Oh, yay. Love that. And she's just, uh, she's saying she loves learning about astrology and dreams. Okay, here's her dream. Most times when I have dreams, they're broken up into separate, tinier dream segments, and last night was one of those. Earlier in my dream, I remember being proposed to by my current boyfriend of four years. I can't remember too much from that part other than seeing him down on one knee, holding out the ring to me, and then later having a ring on my finger. From there, the dream changes up. I sometimes have this reoccurring dream where I'm running from a Halloween version witch on her broomstick <laughs> down a window-lined hallway into a bigger window-lined room. On this occasion, though, I wasn't running alone. I was alongside my current boyfriend, both of us being chased by the witch. Dream me felt like I knew the situation from before, but I could tell that this was more of his first time in this situation. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> Usually, when I run down the corridor and into the windowed room, I can see out to the outside and break through, but only for it to lead into another windowed hallway beginning again, and she never makes it outside. This time, as we were running, we break through the first set of windows back into the hallway again. We continue running to the windowed room again, but this time we choose the wrong spot and cannot break through. We know if we go back to try another window, the witch will catch us. But as we turn around, there's a tall gate. And behind that is a skeleton with a large, long sickle coming upon us. We both realize there's nothing for us to do. There's no way out. The skeleton slices his sickle down over the top of the gate, killing me and then my boyfriend. After he kills us, I remember thinking, we're dead. <laughs> <laughs> but I look over at my boyfriend, who looked very much alive, and look at myself in the mirror very much well. The skeleton then reaches over and hands us what looks like a certificate. <laughs> <laughs> they graduated. 
Yeah. And so then the boyfriend takes his thumb and leaves a print with his blood on that certificate, oh, as I does love it. she. Fabulous. The skeleton leaves with the certificate, leaving me and my boyfriend behind the lock gate to hold hands and lean into each other. After the skeleton sliced us both, I no longer feel scared, but almost calm, knowing my boyfriend is there with me. Mm. The dream usually ends with myself picking the wrong window and mm. getting stuck, right. where the witch catches up and the dream ends. Right. So this is definitely a much different ending than yep. normal. Yep, 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 yep. And it's different because there's a level of integration that has occurred for Holly. Hmm. Now, this seems to be a dream all about her boyfriend, and it might. Like, there might be ways in which the relationship and the dynamic between them is impacting this, mo this dream. In the inner circle of interpretation, where her boyfriend is not relevant to my interpretation, it's just an aspect of Holly, then it's an integration dream where Holly is the witness, the boyfriend is the symbol of masculine principle newly integrated into her, which is being sort of the transformed by a, a wedding, the, the proposal, right? So this is where I want to sort of parse ways of, eh, it might seem like it's a dream about Holly and her boyfriend and like falling more in love, except That's that- That's what I was wondering. Well, and I'm not saying that it's not. Let me be very, very clear. Dreams are multifaceted. Dreams are the dreamer's possession, not mine. <laughs> um, so the dream is- equally reflecting Holly and her relationship with her boyfriend, but also just reflecting Holly's psyche and consciousness. And I am only dealing with that. Partly because Holly's not here. <laughs> so I wouldn't be right. able to engage with her enough in conversation about her and her boyfriend to satisfyingly hold the dream as a reflection of that. But boy, oh boy, I can hold the reflection of what it means for her. And the proposal from the boyfriend is about a readiness to integrate, to receive a new way of choice-making, decisions, goals, and ambitions. Masculine principle is about how we move about the world by virtue of the things we do, the choices we make, and what we focus our, our physical energy on. Whereas the feminine principle is how we are receptive and creative and make new things and receive the world on its own terms and then turn it into something else. That's, that's a feminine principle. We want to be balanced in having access to our doing while also understand that we are, you know, beings of being, being and doing in integration. All right. So let's, let's, it's enough of a starting theme. Let me, let me sort of go through the dream inch by inch and sort of build this case of what I'm talking about. So just starting with the proposal that he's on his knee, he's holding out the ring, and then there's a later image of the ring is on her finger, ipso facto, it's a done deal. The dream starts by telling us there is a new willingness. It's not quite transformed yet, right? They ain't married. But there's a, an agreement and a covenant. That's what the proposal is in real life. I promise to marry you. I promise to do it when the day comes. That's the promise of the engagement. And so in symbolic land, it's a promise to integrate being and doing at a higher level. Now, I'm not entirely certain if the Halloween witch image is a recurring image. Did I? Is that in her words? Yeah, yeah. The witch is always chasing her through the windowed hallway. So it's always a Halloween witch. It's okay. always a Halloween <laughs> witch chasing her That's endlessly. That's adorable. <laughs> well, it's still a symbol of spiritual centeredness, living life organically through the wisdom of the earth and the great mother. You know, witches in Halloween are really just a symbolic representation for something that was, you know, destroyed by the patriarchy and <laughs> we don't really have access to this anymore. But where do we all get some connection to the witchy energy is through Halloween. 
so even though there's a cuteness to that, that you know, the I'm 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 air quoting now the Halloween witch. <laughs> <laughs> it's still that she's being chased by the part of her that would help her live more organically, more connected to the earth, more more, more Gaian in nature, more spiritually, you know, driven. And so the chasing of uh, of both she and the boyfriend by the witch, especially since it's a recurring image, is an ongoing symbol for Holly that represents the dynamic of trying to ground her life in spiritual principles more. Halloween witch. So hallways and the destination room are also about processes that expand our consciousness or change us, right? Hallways are always about transitions. We, we, we don't live in hallways. We use hallways to get to other rooms. So hallways in dreams are representations of that process of being in between, not quite here, not quite there, but in transition. And then, of course, then the room would be sort of symbolic of the next level of awareness that we're working on. Right. In fact, we have this loop in her recurring dream. It's like I'm trying to get to another consciousness. So I'm in this. I'm in this environment of change and transformation. And then I try to get someplace, but it ain't quite done. I got to get out of here, too. And then I'm back again. I'm looping over and over again until. There's a new level of integration. Hmm. See, to me, there's a direct connection of the success of the secondary recurring dream where there's this impulse to get someplace new, but there's this on repeat tripping up into just back again into the hallway again and the hallway again and the hallway again. She can't quite get to the new territory. Now, I love the windows. The windows to me means this is not a deeply unconscious process. We see through windows. We are someplace and we can see outside of it. The fact that both the hallway and the room have windows and she went to great length to make sure we knew that adds a dimension to, for my money, that the process that Holly is in is not secret, hidden, or shadowy. It's something she's aware of. So she even says, I knew this situation before, but this is the boyfriend's first time in this situation. That was quite a moment for me in receiving this dream because that's the thing that makes an undeniable connection between the proposal as a symbol of a new level of integration between masculine and feminine and this event in the dream where suddenly Something is broken through that has never been broken through before for Holly. In fact, when I wrote my notes and, and she said, and you read, I wrote in all caps this time. I wrote that this time in all caps because it seemed really important to me that we break through the first, you know, uh, hallway again, even though we, you know, she bumps into the wrong spot and she can't break through. That to me is a symbol of acceptance. Yeah. And then there's the sort of attempts again. There's this breaking through that occurs. And it didn't happen any other time in Holly's past because she didn't have her boyfriend with her. <laughs> and of course, yeah. it's not about the boyfriend. It's about Holly's integration of masculine principle stuff. And once that new, almost fully integrated energy is present and there's this ability to just keep trying even though we think we're in the wrong spot and can't break through, somehow she gets to new territory. She turns around, there's this gate. Gates are stunning. Gates tell us there's new territory that she's not in yet. This is an important, subtle way that in two ways the dream is saying Holly's almost there, but not quite. The mm -hmm. almost in the first part is, is that she ain't married to this man. The integration isn't fully official, but it's been promised. There's a willingness to be in a new level of integration that hasn't quite happened, but is going to happen. And then this idea of the gate tells us there's new territory to enter, but it's beyond the gate. 
right? So she's not in it. She has to go through the gate. But now she's there. <laughs> it's like a video game, right? The video game right, is right, get right. out of the hallway and into the room and over to the gate. But she didn't, like, over and over again, she's playing the game, she's playing the game, she's never getting there, she's never getting there. Finally, she brings in a new masculine principle, a new way of decision-making and acting uh, uh, in her body that then they get to the gate. The gate is going to be the doorway to the new territory. But what has to happen in order for Holly to get through the gate? She has to die. Death. Death. Wow. <laughs> That's right. So the skeleton, which is a symbol of like the underpinnings of embodiment. What's the bare bones, <laughs> pun, <laughs> <laughs> of our embodiment, <laughs> but our skeleton. So there's something to me about the skeleton as a figure is about we got to get all the way down to the foundation. We got to reinvent all our flesh. And if we allow ourselves to die, if Holly lets herself die to self at this moment, then we know that she's reborn because not only does the, <laughs> the skeleton kill them both and she's saying, I remember thinking, we're dead. <laughs> we're, we're at the gate. I got to die to self. The skeleton comes along and dies, but it's not really a death. It's a rebirth. And then the most important thing is what happens like off stage in the third act, <laughs> which is that she and her boyfriend go through the gate. Yeah. Into brand new territory. So beautiful dream. It's all about change and transformation and change and transformation that's almost complete, but not quite. And as ever, this is another moment where the dream that comes for me seems to match the astrology perfectly. We are all in that same sort of place this week where we're trying to do the thing that we've tried before unsuccessfully. And this week is kind of like trying to bust through that hall of, you know, that hallway of windows into the new territory for the release that's yet to come. Like the release in the astrology is the full moon next week. The change for Holly is post gate. <laughs> And there's also nothing quite like a South Node eclipse where we really and truly have to release our past, where a dream about the acceptance of the scariness of death in order for a rebirth to occur is just kind of how it works. Thank you for listening to Conscious Embodiment, Astrology and Dreams with Dr. Michael Lennox. You can find us on Apple Music, the iHeartRadio app, and anywhere you find your favorite shows. Head on over to michaelennox.com for information on astrology readings, the daily Astro Alert subscription, upcoming classes, and to join the mailing list.